Hello and welcome to another episode of Crushing Comics, the show where I fall in love with my comic collection all over again. I am here to unwrap a book and let's get to it. I think we should probably just finish off this shelf here so we have room. Oh my goodness, this might be multiple books. Wow. So I'm wearing my Atari shirt today. My wife has a spectacular track record of finding really cool pop culture shirts out in the world that I have never dreamt existed and getting them for me. Uh, that's She's actually the person who acquired the Moon Knight shirt that I wore a few episodes ago. And I love this shirt because I had an Atari. I had several Ataris as a kid. And I remember the one was like the wooden one with the little like slats across it. And then later I had the one that was like kind of a sort of a computer, like it had a keyboard and you could, I guess, get memory for it. But the onboard memory was only such that if you use the keyboard, you could just type to the top of the screen and then whatever scrolled up was gone. And I would just write these never ending stories that would kind of disappear off the top of the screen. Um, it's kind of like the 1980 version of Snapchat. Like once it was gone, it was gone. And uh, so I had Atari. I loved Joust. I loved Frogger. Uh, I don't know. I, ha I had a ton of games that I really, really liked. And so to me, it's not just this retro thing. And I think that that's, you know, it's, I'm on the cusp of two generations. Like, I don't ever really think of myself as a millennial, but I was a little bit young to get the Gen X stuff. Like, I was only in eighth grade when Kurt Cobain died, which I think is a lot of people how they measure where they were in Gen X. Like, I was only becoming aware of Nirvana as they were gone. And, um... So now people say that there's this like middle ground generation called Xennials. Oh my gosh, I cannot get this out. This mi middle ground generation called Xennials that represent those few years kind of in between. And that's where I am. And I think it's the difference between like kids who probably had their own Ataris maybe and then kids who just had their parents' Ataris and then whose primary game system was Nintendo, which really it was for me. Uh, let's see. So I love, the point of that whole story is I love having this shirt because I do have memories of the Atari joystick and playing those Atari games. Okay. Oh, wow! Okay. Uh, this, this could be just one episode's worth, let's see, because I don't know how much I have to say about all these books. Okay. So this is a really cool book. This is Wonder Woman, the complete newspaper strips from 1944 to 1945. And, oh gee, okay. So a couple of things to think about here. First of all, this is published by IDW, not by DC Comics. IDW has this very cool uh, designation where I guess they have a really good reprint and archive management department. I don't really know the whole story, but Marvel and DC actually default to IDW for some of their archival stuff, especially newspaper strips. Although Marvel's actually using them now for like some kids' Star Wars adventures. IDW just has certain specialties other than just their licensed comics, and those are some of them. And so all the newspaper strip reprints from both DC and Marvel tend to go to IDW. You have to think, comics were distributed so widely in the past that we can't even conceive of it now. If you were around in the 90s, the early 90s, you can kind of conceive of it from when there were like a million copies of X-Force and X-Men 1 and things like that. But even then, the market had been tilted to the direct market and there was this idea of addressing demand before the comic book actually came out and hit the shelves. In the Silver Age and Golden Age, the goal was to just get a comic book on every newsstand. And in order to do that in America, the print runs of even the most insignificant unpurchased comic book were higher than the highest print runs of comic books today. And the distribution was huge. I mean, that's part of how these heroes are in the public awareness. Not that every single person was buying Captain America or Iron Man or Superman in... Well, let's not use Superman because he had his own television show and that's a different realm. But not that everybody was buying the Fantastic Four in 1961, but a large number of people were seeing the Fantastic Four in 1961 because it was on every newsstand in every drugstore. So now take that, the concept that every newsstand probably had a few comics of each comic, but then think about newspapers, which at the time were how the vast majority of people got their news, and the idea that you might have a strip of a comic character, all in black and white of course, in a newspaper and think of how wide the circulation, not just of one newspaper is, but every newspaper, potentially every major newspaper across the United States. So that's how big the reach was for these. And there are Spider-Man strips, there are Superman strips. The Wonder Woman strips are, I won't say 
unusual, but I'll say remarkable, in that they were created by the original Wonder Woman team. Oh my goodness. I, th I think some bird must have just collided with my house. Did you hear that? I'm safe in here in the comics bunker. Um, this was created by the original Wonder Woman's team of William Moulton Marston, Mar I never say his name right, William Moulton Marston and H.G. Peter. So these, I'm not entirely certain, certain if these are meant to exist in the same universe as the earliest Wonder Woman comics, but they are meant to look and sound and feel like the Wonder Woman uh, that we know from the earliest Wonder Woman comics, because that was the team. Here's an early version of the cheetah, who just looks like a chubby house cat. Isn't that great? So I, Wonder Woman is one of those characters that I really try to own everything by. I love her, and uh, I love, now that my daughter's old enough to read comics, the way that my daughter loves her. And so I'm really happy. It's funny, as I was buying the Wonder Woman archives, I was, um, I was saying to myself, you know, I, I should get these to read with my kid one day. And I did not have a kid, and people would be like, that is ridiculous. You cannot use a, an imaginary child as an excuse to buy comic books, but lo and behold, I'm reading my Wonder Woman comics with her, so I guess I was right. All right, so that's Wonder Woman. Let's see what's next. Uh, okay. So two Neil Gaiman deluxes here. Death, the high cost of living. Actually, it's just Death, the deluxe edition, because it has high cost of living and also the other one, uh, Time of Your Life. And then I also have Sandman Overture, which is really one of the most gorgeous books you could look at in the past couple of years. That's with art by J.H. Williams. So of course Neil Gaiman had the Sandman epic. It ran for 75 issues and even though people mistakenly think that he owns that character, he doesn't. It's a DC character even though it was at Vertigo which many people now think of as a creator-owned line. Gaiman didn't own it. He has a very very strong agreement with DC about how they use the character that they have always been happy to adhere to because uh, they make a ton of money off of it. And, like, Sandman, Morpheus, is currently in DC Knights, Dark Knights, DC Dark Knights, Metal, so, named so confusingly. And Scott Snyder, like, called Neil Gaiman on the phone and said, pretty, pretty please, can I use Morpheus in this? And got his permission. So, over the years, Gaiman has added occasionally onto the Sandman universe, and they each get put in absolute editions, but sometimes with only a very slim amount of material. So this Death, the High Cost of Living um, deluxe, deluxe book is maybe like six issues, seven issues, uh, but there's actually an absolute edition of this, which I do want, because you'll see eventually I do have all of the Sandman absolutes, but it's hard to justify like 50, 60 bucks for this in that size. Uh, and you'll notice it's still wrapped. I've never actually read Death. But here's a couple of things I will say about it. Uh, even though Sandman was a huge phenomenon and was huge in pop culture, Death was weirdly the way that I think Gaiman crossed over to other people. Not just because Death was a little bit more bite-sized and addressing issues that people could relate to and were interested in reading and surprised to read in comic books, uh, such as HIV AIDS, but because you had people from outside of comic books really enthusing about death in a way that um, maybe hadn't been as felt at the time about Sandman. And she's a, you know, it's death. She's a very enduring figure and the illustration of her is beautiful. I think uh, Chris Bacalo is the illustrator of one of these two, but I don't know. Uh, who's the illustrator of the other one. So that's Death. And then the other thing is Neil Gaiman's Sandman Overture. This is a really interesting book. Um, it was huge news when DC announced it, because anytime Gaiman's going to come back and touch anything, let alone Sandman, it's a big deal. But this was big news because Sandman 1 kind of starts, like, right in the middle of a story. Sandman's already in kind of dire straits, and there's really not an explanation of how he gets there. You just go with it. And Gaiman insists that he always had that story to tell, and it just never fit into any of the arcs that he was writing on Sandman. And this is that story. It shows what directly preceded the Sandman story. And J.H. Williams is my one of my favorite artists. I got to know him through his art on Batwoman, which he also was co-writing, but he also was an artist on Alan Moore's Promethea for the entire series, and many people came to him via that. I don't actually know a whole lot of other things. He did some Batman issues. Uh, I don't know what he's up to now. I guess he's cooking his own thing. But he was up to this for a while, and his artwork is just unbelievable. 
I mean, I don't, I don't even think me flipping through the pages. I can't fit me and the book on the camera. I don't even know if me flipping through the pages is going to do it justice, but actually DZ is going to do it some justice because they are issuing an omnibus of this in 2018. There's only, again, five issues, I think. Uh, they're issuing an omnibus of this in 2018, six issues, and it's going to be this whole thing, which is not that large, and then uh, the whole thing in black and white. Because they're like, the art, man! And you know what? I, I'm the sucker who will buy that, because I love his art. If I just said omnibus, I meant absolute, by the way. Uh, there's actually a direct market cover of this one, too. Let's see what's under the dust jacket, by the way. Oh, yeah. Just Sandman being awesome. Okay. It's, you know what? Here's what I'll have to say for the story, because I have read this. Uh, you don't necessarily have to have read Sandman, although it has a lot of references that you probably won't understand if you've never read Sandman. Uh... But it's just obtuse to begin with. Like, it is not... No game in comic is like a page-through-it kind of comic, the way that you might page through an Amazing Spider-Man. So, I would still recommend trying it. I don't I don't think you need to read all of Sandman to read it. I think if you're super fascinated by that, then it will be interesting to read Sandman. But it's kind of the same thing as, like... Well, this is, in a way, a terrible analogy of Star Wars prequels and Star Wars. Like, some people came to the to it via the prequels and like those stories. And then when they re watch Star Wars, they still like the stories, but, uh, you know, it seems a little bit antiquated. Sandman has aged very well, but it doesn't look like that. Nothing about the storytelling is antiquated compared to this, but it, it just do and it has amazing art, but it just doesn't look like modern, made in 2015, J.H. Uh, Williams artwork. Cover colored, by the way, by uh, Dave Stewart, who's one of the Great living comic book colors. All right, two quick hits here because I don't know too much about these books. This is another Vertigo book. It's called Day Tripper by Fabio Moon and Gabriel Ba. Uh, I this was like a I better just pick it up and bank it to original eventually read it. It was on my wish list forever, and uh, everybody in the comic groups I, I frequent on the internet it was like, "It's amazing. It made me cry. You should read it." And that's all I know about it. it. Doesn't even all it says is, "What are the most important days of your life?" So I I cry. I, I mean I cry just about everything. So, um, I'm sure I'm going to cry when I read that. And then this one, actually, I can say something for this one. This is Mystery Society. It's um, art by Fiona Staples, who's the uh, multiple Eisner award-winning artist of Saga, which is why I purchased it, and written by Steve Niles, who I'm not that familiar with. But it is, it's just this very, very amusing book of sort of like a pulp hero team, but not really, like almost Indiana Jonesy. Uh, and they, them kind of investigating somewhat supernatural things from antiquity. And I love it because not only is the art great, I mean, Staples, even pre-Saga, is a fantastic artist. But um, it, it's so acerbic. The lead character reminds me a lot of um, Carrie, I never say his name right, Carrie Yul Louise, Yul Yul the guy from Princess Bride. My wife is going to smack me for not being able to say his name because we talk about him all the time and she loves She's not really going to smack me. Rhetorically, she's going to smack me. Uh, and I could just picture him as this guy. But yeah, it's this very kind of acerbic, flirty couple and their adventures in trying to uncover uh, the abnormal. Uh, the back cover reads, Together, Nick and Anastasia, husband and wife, are the mystery society, rich, resourceful, and refined, and determined to uncover the secrets of the world's underbelly. Their ranks are about to expand thanks to the addition of a ghoul named Secret Skull, two twins, Nick Sprung from Area 51, and a robot with the brain of Jules Verne. Uh, I think if you like or even dislike uh, Manhattan Projects, but as one viewer was recently saying, it's just such a boys club, which history was at that point, but that doesn't mean stories about history have to be if they're not meant to be entirely accurate. Uh, but if you like that vibe of like people inventing and discovering, but you want something that feels a little bit more well-rounded, I think you would like this. If you're an Indiana Jones fan, fan, I think you would like this. It doesn't necessarily appeal to you just because you like Saga because it's not written by BKV, uh, but the art is fantastic and I really enjoyed it. Uh, it's not kid appropriate. I was I reading it to at the time was probably one years old and uh, I I was like, oh, this is a little risque at points, but I don't know if my one-year-old really can understand that. So, uh, great book. So that was our stack for today. Now for the ceremonial shelving, if I can even get them all back together here. Oh my goodness. Wonder Woman, honestly, is going to a different location on the shelf. These probably all are, because this, this is the independent wing of the library right now. And this is the marble wing, with some uh, library editions. But, I don't know, should we shelve for pretend or shelve for real? We'll shelve for pretend, and then I'll find them the place that they need to go. So... Here are Death, ooh, 
Young Men Overture Mystery Society and Day Tripper for their ceremonial shelving. And here is Wonder Woman, the complete newspaper strips. Thanks so much for tuning in to another episode of Crushing Comics. I hope you enjoyed, and I hope you'll be back next time to help me unpack my comic book collection. Thanks so much. Bye.